Psst, into the lockdown, quick, before the patrols see us. An elven prison guard, wearing half chain, half plate, armed with nothing more than a simple crossbow, requesting the Inquisitor General and her half orc follow him into the lockdown. She'll oblige. As he's escaped, he must be more intelligent than the one above that had to free. Hopefully this one knows more. Inside the lockdown is the corpse of a former guard, skewered like a boar and still smoldering. And at the far end, stocks or a guillotine. It's hard to tell. As he mentioned patrols, it would probably be a good idea to close the door, too. Though, they really surprised to hear that there are any patrols at all. Perhaps the prisoners on this lower level yes. of the prison are more organized. Something? Better equipped, too, she had to guess. I greet you. All right, here's Emmernick. You're not with the prisoners, are you? <laughs> Why on earth would he have invited us in? We thought so. Thank goodness you've come, then. They've been going from cell to cell, killing us guards. I think I'm the last one left. Yeah, asking who he is. Just a guard. The name's Emmernick. How did he escape? I squeezed through the bars and snapped the neck of the prisoner they sent to butcher me. Too little, too late. The others are all dead. Are you saying that it's safe here? You're asking what he knows about the head gailer. He was torturing some of his former guards on the bottom level till he managed to escape. He kept talking about cutting us, getting inside our heads. <laughs> of course, this is making sense to Lily. Some of our guys came out of there looking like zombies. The rest of us were discarded. It says the head gailer has a right-hand man named a half-orc named Curden Fenkt. One of the meanest prisoners in the pit. The pit. That's where you're headed. There aren't many cells down there except those the prisoners built themselves. What they did in the pits was their business. Alright, sounds like a... <laughs> Alright. I say the cell doors are locked, but everything else should be open. Well, there's no interest in opening cell doors. If you can get inside a lockdown and seal it up, you should be safe inside, which I think we've done just now. So it'll probably be safe to rest. Yeah, asking if there are any other hostages. They barricaded themselves in the central guard room. Oh, he's talking about the prisoners. Setting out patrols, but it's pretty haphazard. Killed off a couple without them noticing. He's asking where the storerooms are. North and south. Alright. This place is a death trap right now. I'll secure the area. <laughs> Sure enough, it sounds like the intellect of our is feeding on the brains of guards. Their purpose wasn't as hostages, only sentient delicacies presumably preferable to the prisoners. And it also sounds like Curtin Fanked is going to stand in the way between the Inquisitor General and the Head Gailer. No matter. She's confident her Uthgard is the meaner half or She hopes. Otherwise, Although she doesn't yet prepare Magic Circle against evil, she studies the required diagrams, figures, and sigils required to be traced on the ground with powdered silver. Casting circles is not as easy as it sounds. At a minimum, one must trace the circle itself. But more powerful circles can be cast by tracing a diagram within the circle, a triangle, square, pentagon, or the like, depending on the nature of the spell. 
and even the diagram can be augmented with various magical sigils. Here's a former prisoner, but I guess the question is whether he's alone or not. Looks like he might be. All right. <laughs> Sounds like he didn't make it. Needless to say, casting circles can be a complicated affair, and one simple mistake can render the entire diagram useless. whole bunch of them is hanging outside probably this main central area like he was talking about along with an attack dog all right I think bones will hang out here and um well I'd like to get sleep out there but for the for the main group all right, just round of frost for this guy. All right, crew. Let's take them down. All right. Sitting out sleep. What is Lily doing? All right. Yeah. Bad, li bad line of sight, I guess. Alright, try this again. Sleep. Taste my savage for the oath guards! Wow, only one of them. Try it again. Nope. What's he doing? <laughs> Alright, crew. Let's take them down. Not sure what Dalian's doing. Just hanging out. Escape prisoner. Can't tell if he's casting a spell. Alright. Magic missile. Oh. Yeah. Spellcaster. Alright. Just to interrupt him, negative energy. Up to his bones. Big da Dalian's got it. Oh boy. I think he just ran in there. Got somebody. What's going on in here? Oh, look at this. Escaped sorcerer. <laughs> Alright. Malfs. Oh, I think he resisted it or something. Magic missile. Kind of wary of what else is in the room. Damage resistance. Hopefully that 
I'm not sure if that'll interrupt. Maybe not. Those bones. Alright. Taste my savage fury! Yeah, I think that's another worry, is that there might be a full group of prisoners hanging out by each door. Hopefully not. Boy, look at all of them. Alright. Negative energy. Just follow me. All right. Stay close. Just need to regroup. Okay. I think I may have opened a can of worms. <laughs> Concerning Dungeons and Dragons in prisons, I was going to talk about how the Walpin Correctional Institution, a maximum security penitentiary in Wisconsin, banned the game Dungeons and Dragons in 2004 at the recommendation of the prison specialist on gangs, who said it could lead to gang behavior and fantasies about escape. Prison officials said D&D could foster an inmate's obsession with escaping from the real-life correctional environment, fostering hostility, violence, and escape behavior, and that it could make it more difficult to rehabilitate prisoners and could endanger public safety. The prison's decision to ban D&D, by the way, was upheld by the U.S. Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals last year, which caused a flurry of media coverage, <laughs> including the facetious question of why works of fiction like The Count of Monte Cristo shouldn't also be banned. By the way, I couldn't bring that story up and not talk about the larger controversy Dating all the way back to the 1970s, same decade in which modern role-playing games first emerged. That is, the question of whether players of role-playing games are more likely to have difficulties distinguishing between reality and fantasy, leading to psychological problems or even real violence. Another storeroom, and given Bones' silence, presumably empty. Or is it? <laughs> Alright. So much for that. They were lurking in here. Is she trapped? Holy cow. <laughs> Can't even get her to run. Alright. Unleashed! Certainly a surprise. I think we're all <laughs> lucky. Would have been certain death. Alright. Make of energy. Alright, I think she wants to get the bones out of there. Might be trapped though. Alright, it's too late. Are we calling bones? <laughs> the first case concerns James Dallas Egbert III. At only 16 years of age by 1979, he was already a student at Michigan State University, a child prodigy of sorts. He was also a player of Dungeons & Dragons, which had only been around for, what, two years? Under a state of depression, he entered the school's steam tunnels and later went into hiding elsewhere, becoming a missing person. 
His parents hired private investigator William Deere, who theorized that Egbert became lost in the steam tunnels during a live-action version of D&D. Soon after, the press exaggerated the case, and before you knew it, the steam tunnel urban legend was born. College students were playing live-action role-playing games underneath college campuses across the country, some even dying of hypothermia or other causes. Two years later, Rona Jaffe published the novel Mazes and Monsters, a fictionalization of the Egbert case, which was adapted into the made-for-television movie of the same name, starring Tom Hanks the next year. The story depicts an obsessed gamer who's unable to distinguish fantasy from reality. At the same time, John Coyne published his novel Hobgoblin about a teenage boy who becomes obsessed with a role-playing game based on Celtic mythology called Hobgoblin, and who's also unable to distinguish fantasy from reality. Mike Lowry reviewed both books He's in done. 1983 in Dragon Magazine issue number 75, and I quote, Neither of these books is likely to be enlightening to the fantasy role-playing gamer except as examples of what reasonably intelligent adult non-players imagine we must be like. <laughs> in both books, the attainment of mature adulthood is accompanied by the abandonment of role-playing games. Need I say more? End quote. Oh, <laughs> 